I am uh, David Ronchek. I lead uh, open source machine learning here at Azure, and uh, I co-founded Kubeflow. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, combining CI, CD, and ML into ML ops. It's a term that I think we've all heard or is starting to catch a lot of fire. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about some of the things we saw in Kubeflow and at Azure about how to get these models to production and, and really that ML ops is the only way to go about it. Um, at Azure, we're, we're quite proud of our lineage when it comes to ML. Um, we spent a long time in it, uh, really addressing all the various concerns that you have as part of bringing an ML solution to market, whether or not it's uh, maintaining control of your data or folding in Microsoft data, uh, using the hyperscale of, of Azure, um, and, you know, including uh, advanced chipsets and, and uh, InfiniBand and so on. Uh, but then also a lot of breakthrough advancements that we love to give back to the community. Um, you can see some of those here. In 2016, um, we moved, uh, we contributed back papers around object recognition and human, uh, to reach human parity. 2017, speech recognition. 2018, um, uh, machine translation and machine reading comprehension. And again, we believe very strongly in the ML community. This would not be possible if we hadn't built on the shoulders of the giants who came before us. And we gave it all back because we want the next generation of people to be able to take it um, and, and leverage up the machine learning community like we've seen so often. At Microsoft, we use ML extremely deeply. Uh, we use it for just about every product we have, whether or not it's consumer or business, whether or not it's gaming or you know, uh, 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 internet connectivity for uh, Skype and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, Microsoft Research. Virtually every product at Microsoft touches ML in some way. And you can see some of the scale that we do um, here. Um, 180 million active users for Office 365 using components of ML, uh, 18 billion questions asked of Cortana, and, and every day 6.5 trillion um, signals are analyzed on behalf of Windows users using ML technology, whether or not it's local to your individual laptop, on your device, or in the cloud. Uh, these numbers are so big that it's, we simply would not be able to address these problem sets if we weren't using ML behind them. So that's great, and you see a lot of people come up and talk about all the advancements of ML. Um, but the reality is, is that ML is quite hard still. And um, more often than not, the reason it's hard is because a lot of folks approach their ML problems like this. And they say, well, you know, I'm just going to go out and download or build a you know, significant model, and that is going to be the end of it. But I think, as, as most of you know in, the, uh, in this room, uh, ML is not just building a model, of course. It's all of these steps. It's uh, inputting your data, cleaning it, validating it, uh, running through uh, uh, training and iteration, rolling the model out to scale uh, in distributed computing and so on, uh, and then finally rolling it out to production for serving, batch, or real time, uh, logging it, monitoring it, and having that all come back. OK, so you're a data scientist. Uh, you don't care about that. Who cares, right? Um, but you do. And the reason is, is because you don't want to be sending a tweet like this. Um, you know, we hear this all the time from customers, where a machine learning solution model gets great area under the curve, gets great accuracy. This is fantastic. Let's go roll it out. And 11 months later, it's still sitting in some code repository. Uh, well, why is that the case? More often than not, it's something like this. On the left-hand side, you have a data scientist. She is operating extremely quickly. She wants to iterate. She wants to use the latest tools. She wants to use as much capability as she has available to her, GPUs, CPUs, uh, very large clusters, and so on. Uh, and she really doesn't care about management headaches. If you know, her configuration is out of date or something like that, who cares? She'll just uh, flatten, the, flatten the cluster and start over. On the right-hand side, you have almost the exact opposite. The SRE cares deeply about costs. She cares deeply about observability and monitorability. Uh, she has lots of people using her systems, so she can't just go out and flatten it. Um, and more often than not, uh, also things around corporate compliance. She can't just you know, delete a bunch of data and say, you know, OK, now I'm GDPR compliant. There's enormous amounts of things that need uh, integration there in order to do it properly. OK, but we can bring these two together. Let's figure it out. We, so the question is, I'm a big pattern, ma pattern matcher. Haven't I heard this before? And you have, right? This was a problem that a lot of folks addressed, you know, about five years, started to address about five years ago using something called GitOps. 
And that's the idea that you can iterate very quickly on the left-hand side and give your developer all the tools she needs to go and build a bunch of great applications. But then through always using Git and always using a, de a declarative way to push out pipelines, you can roll that out to production in a declarative way, a predefined way, giving you both velocity and security. So what do we need? We need MLOps, right? And that's where you do the same thing. You give that data scientist uh, a very quick inner loop using tools that she's familiar with, maximum flexibility, but then you fold that into your overall Git uh, pipelines and include all the necessary tools to roll that out and feel very secure about how you get that to production. And if you do that, you know, our goals are what you see here that you have automation and observability, you know exactly what's running in production, you know how to observe it, you can use standard tools, uh, you get validation, particularly static uh, validation rather than waiting for runtime to know that you didn't declare a variable and now you know, nothing is, is uh, resolving, or uh, converging, excuse me. And you get reproducibility and auditability. Um, the ability to declaratively say exactly what is running in production is extremely critical, but it's not just that. It allows you, if so, at some point in the future you need to reproduce it, either in your own organization or share it with someone else, you, because you know exactly what's running in production, you can hand them the code and the entire pipeline, and they can go and reproduce it on their own. Okay, so lots of folks have gone out and built internal systems for doing exactly this. At uh, Google, they had uh, TensorFlow Extended, internally called MLX. Uh, Facebook has FB Learner Flow, uh, Uber, Michelangelo, Microsoft has Ether, and this is just a small set. Uh, more often than not, once you reach a certain size of data science team, you're going to need some form of process for accomplishing these things. But you, I know, don't want to go and work at a large company with thousands of engineers. You want to go do this yourself. And you can. The way that uh, we recommend doing it is something like this. You take your ML platform, whatever it might be, Kubeflow, Azure Machine Learning, doesn't matter what. You layer on Git on top of that, and then you layer on your CI CD system on top of that. And there are a lot of CI CD systems out there. Uh, if you are thinking of a startup project, let me recommend not building a CI CD system. We have lots. Uh, make the existing ones better. Regardless, um, you see this, and you want to like layer all these things together. You want to think about the various layers of your system and fold them into a process where you can drive everything in that declarative way through using nothing more than Git. Now, I'm going to take off my cloud neutral hat just for a moment and talk about some of the things on Azure that allow you to do this. Um, and, and by this, this is a, it's a layout similar to what you see here. In that middle section, you have the top level orchestrator. Uh, that might be Jenkins, it could be Azure DevOps, it could be GitHub Actions, it could be Bamboo or Circle CI, it doesn't matter what. And that's where you have the concept of being able to integrate all of these various services together um, at a high level. Um, that means that it's not going to be domain specific. It's going to understand how to do DAGs and do restarts and things like that, but it's not going to understand what a data set is. It's not going to understand what a model is or a model package format or a container or anything like that. It's going to hand that off to a second layer. And we see this layout all the time. So what happens here is you have your data scientist and she checks her code into Git. Um, and then Git will fire off for that orchestrator, or the orchestrator will see that that's changed, and it will fire off a specific pipeline. In this case, this data scientist has her data on-prem, because that's where she's collecting IoT data, for example. Um, she doesn't necessarily want to move that to the cloud. It's not appropriate, and, and she already has a bunch of storage sitting around. So that CI CD system in the middle is going to fire off, for example, a Spark job on-prem, and it will run through the entire Spark job as we speak. And then at the end of it, it will hand back to the CI CD system and say, here's the metadata around this. Here's the pointer to where I store this information. Go and do the next step. At that point, the CI CD system picks that up and goes off to the distributed cloud and says, oh, this is great. The model trains. I have the metadata. I know where the storage of the system is. Uh, I'm going to now fire off potentially a staging environment and walk through that, and then I'm going to hand it back to the CI CD system for the SRE to finally go forward and manually begin the rollout process. But that kind of flexibility brings these two worlds together. The data scientist continues to be able to execute on her side, but the CI CD system neutralizes as it comes back, and the data SRE is able to go forward. Okay, 
Uh, at Azure, we offer a number of solutions here um, for individual steps, one of those like dark black circles you saw there. Um, and I'll talk about some of these. This is uh, model versioning and storage. Uh, you can do that from an API, and we offer a hosted solution for that. Uh, Azure ML also offers model validation. We have unit testing and so on uh, through hosted services. Uh, we offer model profiling, so you can hand back uh, a model and give us an array of a search area to understand exactly what's going on with your model and identify the proper hardware for that. Uh, and then, of course, model deployment. Again, with uh, human gates, uh, with uh, all the governance you require, and, of course, the ability to do a gradual rollout and, and watch it as it rolls out to make sure that it is, in fact, serving in production properly. Okay. So that's some of the things, the services we offer from Azure. We have a lot more. Um, and you can roll your own. But more often than not, these are ex extremely hard problems that use a lot of highly variable compute. So if you can hand that problem off to some other solution in order to do that, uh, we hear a lot of customers wanting to do that. And so you might say, this seems like a lot of work. Uh, and it is. But you know it's even more work than this, right? Sitting around for 11 months, not having your thing in, produ in production. OK, so MLOps gets you all of this good stuff. End-to-end -end ownership, gets you continuous value. You're able to roll these things out extremely quickly. Uh, and it really allows you to do that lineage, automation, uh, uh, um, auditability, regulation, and, and things like that that enterprises and, and data requires. OK, so that's my spiel. Uh, and you might say, why am, are we doing this? And I'm going to give you three real-world examples that we have seen many, many times over. The first is, does my model actually work? And you're like, well, that seems pretty straightforward. Does my model work? Um, well, here's a real scenario that we see. Um, your data scientist comes along. TensorBoard looks great. Aaron and the curve looks great. Uh, absolutely converging. This is going to be awesome. Time to roll it out. So she checks it into source control and pushes it to production. What, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, Oops. Oh, well, there's fire. Um, and the reality is, is that, oh, there it is. <laughs> Pay attention to me. All right, well, whatever. Funny animation. Um, these, <laughs> I put a t tweet out about this a few months ago about things that can go wrong in production. This, this list was generated by fo my followers, and I don't have a lot of them, uh, in like five minutes. These are real problems that people have today. And you're like, but it's a model. How hard could it be? It's this hard. Uh, or it just doesn't work at all for something that's not here. You just have no idea what's going on. Uh, by the way, you don't have to capture this. I have it as a gist. Please come and add your own. Uh, I would love to. But this is real. These are real problems because we haven't folded those data scientists into the standard software development lifecycle that uh, we give data scientists everywhere, or excuse me, de software developers everywhere. And so we really need to do better. Um, now, what did we do with software development? We added CICD. And what that meant is, instead of just rolling it out to production, you gave them a pipeline of services that let you check a whole bunch of things before you run it into production. So maybe you clean, minimize your code, you run automated tests against it, compilation, you look for biases, um, you package it for rollout in, in whatever binary your system is using, uh, either for batch or real time. Uh, and then you finally do roll it out to production, but you do it sanely. So you do, one per, you do a canary, 1%, 10%, and so on. And then everyone's happy. So you can do all of these manually. And that's true, you can. No, you can't. And the reason is, is because even if you trained all of these people to do all of these things, you still need a written record of what you did. And that's why checking all this into GitOps, or excuse me, into Git, and having a declarative pipeline rather than you do on your own is going to make all the difference in the world. So that's what MLOps gives you. So, does my model actually work? MLOps helps you solve that. Second, what did my customers actually see? So here we have our SRE, ML engineer, doing our uh, best. And our customer over there on the right-hand side wants to uh, get a loan. Uh, the front end of the system says, no, you are not qualified for the loan. 
and the uh, poor customer says, why? And uh, you have lawyers. <laughs> so that's not great. Uh, the SRE doesn't know what's going on because she did it all manually, right? And she doesn't remember that she you know, set nulls to equal to zero and cut everyone's who, age who was over 150 and so on and so forth because those were obviously outliers. Um, she doesn't remember that. It's not her responsibility to remember it. That's why you need processes in order to do this. So models are complicated, but you need to have a written record for all of this. How did you train? How did you exclude? What are your statistics? Uh, how do you slice versus different protected populations, underrepresented minorities, and so on? Uh, and this is where MLOps can really help. And so now you do the same thing, except by doing it through a pipeline, first, you SHA every step of that pipeline, so you know exactly what you ran. And then you SHA the entire thing and say, hey, you know what? We Not just each step in the pipeline, but we're going to like capture the entire thing. And you push that out. And now you know very specifically in that immutable data store, she says, why didn't I get a loan? And, she says, and you're able to say, well, it's this version of the model that, that happened. And so we can go back and explore that at some point in the future and hopefully stave off that army of lawyers. OK, so now you know what your customers see. Now, finally, we're going to say, is my model still good? Uh, drift and uh, change is one of the biggest problems we have today, and I think it is still deeply un misunderstood uh, and underexplored. So I'm going to play a little game with you. We're a bunch of smart people. Let's see what we can come up with here. It, we have a barn. Inside the barn, we have a yellow duck uh, or a blue duck. That's all I'm going to tell you. And so we're going to do uh, machine learning to solve this, because machine learning is the best. Why wouldn't we? So we're going to go build our model. And the model says it's a blue duck. But wait, you don't even know anything, right? You, you can't guess. I'm going to tell you there are 995 yellow ducks in the population and five blue ducks in the population. And the accuracy of your model is fantastic. It's 99% false positive rate, 1%. What is the likelihood that my model is actually accurate, that it is, in fact, a blue duck? You want to know who knows? This guy knows. <laughs> and he knows you know, because of this. They always say, like, if you want to get good uh, reviews for your talk, uh, put math in it. So <laughs> I'm, go <laughs> I'm going with this. Anyhow, so Bayes' theorem, obviously, uh, it figures out about statistics. And basically, the net of it is that the accuracy ultimately depends on the distribution of the population. So anyone want to guess? What's the likelihood that this is uh, a blue duck? Uh, is it 1%, 5, 10, 50? Anyone want to guess? Two thirds of the time, it is wrong if I tra train naively. That means I literally could take the opposite result of my model and be right more often, right? Not good. Um, now, you can solve for this, but you need to have awareness of your population. And so, oh, sorry. Um, so who cares? Well, here you go, right? Um, uh, you have people doing face uh, recognition technology, particularly against criminals, all the time. You know what the pre penetration of criminals is in the population? Really, really low. So if you have a model that is trained naively and it shows your face, you're more than likely going to come up as a criminal. And that is just statistics. There's no way around that. Uh, and of course, you can't opt <laughs> out of it either, right? So this is a real thing that we are facing today, and we need to be aware of it. So you can address it. You need to understand what's going on in the population. You need to train with an awareness of the distribution and so on. And so in fact, I'm going to retrain this using that great pipeline I laid out before, except with updated data and statistics and so on to make sure I get it right. And now when it says it's a blue duck, I can be more confident that it is a blue duck. Unfortunately, things change, right? And so now there was a migration and global warming, and uh, all of a sudden now it's 50-50. All right, what do I do now? My model is going to be wrong again because I trained it on a different distribution of the population. And because I need to be watching it all the time, um, I need to go and retrain as fast as I can and be more accurate. So is my model still good? They can go stale extremely quickly. The example I always like to give is, you know, let's say the New York Giants are in the Super Bowl, and it's Saturday uh, in America. The Super Bowl is on Sunday. Uh, so the, uh, actually, all around the world, the Super Bowl is on Sunday. Um, but regardless, uh, the, 
New York Giants are in the Super Bowl and it's great and I have a ticket system and someone types in Giants, it's likely they're looking for a ticket for the Super Bowl. On Monday, the day after the Super Bowl, if someone types in Giants, probably no longer looking for the Super Bowl. Um, that's not good, and we need, that's how you need to have continuous retraining, and you need to have a pipeline that not only watches all that information, but then passes through the statistics of the samples of real-world examples that you're doing right now. Without a pipeline, this would be extremely hard. Uh, you, in order to do continuous training, you're just gonna need that. So, is my model still good? Uh, we solved that too. So with that, you know, what's next for MLOps? Well, we really are just getting started. Um, uh, software obviously gives you best practices for uh, building machine learning solutions. Um, it gives you that repeatable workflow that you need in order to execute all of these individual steps uh, over and over again. Uh, and not just you know, execute them, but get a set number of uh, examples and tests and things like that so you can not look at not just the steps, but also the metadata and things behind it so you know what happened when you ran it. Um, and not just when you ran it, but when it's out there in production, you get that immutable record of, um, of what's out there running in production, which again is so critical because you're always gonna need that. You're gonna need that flag for what's going on when someone comes to you and says what's actually happening. Uh, and you're gonna want to additionally get lineage all the way back to your data sources. So, um, you know, no one trains on select star, you know, from database. They always have a data set, or you shouldn't, if you are, please come talk to me because you're in trouble. Um, uh, you're gonna have a data set, a known data set that's out there that's a subset of your original, and likely that's gone through a transformation. So again, you're gonna need to record that somewhere um, and figure out what's going on. And then finally, um, it gives you that acceleration from code to real customer benefits. Because once you build that, type line, uh, that pipeline, you're able to roll out much more quickly and repeatably. Um, now, it doesn't give you all this for free. It does require some human work and some software work. Um, data scientists are likely gonna be the most impacted. You're, um, uh, you know, today, they might walk into, you know, uh, have on their corner, on their very powerful laptop, whatever it might be, um, have a, a decent cluster and a sizable machine and want to run those models very quickly. And the reality is that's great for an inner loop, but you're going to need to help them move forward to join you know, software development, proper software development, when it comes to rolling these things out. Um, what's next for MLOps? Well, I have a lot of uh, hope that we're able to tackle some of these problems. And, and you were already making progress. Excuse me. Um, we want to simplify the monitoring and retraining. Again, that yellow duck, red duck, or blue duck example, um, that only works if you're able to automatically fold all that information from your production workloads back into your training pipeline. If you're not, then you're going to have the same problem because you know, even though you have that data, it's out on an island. So the extent to which we can simplify that, the better it is. Um, I, I really want to extend MLOps to the data and uh, prep and, and, and data profiling. Uh, steps, uh, incredibly important for us to get a structured schema around these uh, data sets that are created, including things like statistics, lineage, uh, fingerprinting, and so on. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of enterprise features here coming in, uh, auditability, security, and things like that. Um, uh, today, again, models are generated on the fly, on laptops, on untrusted machines, so on and so forth, and we need to have those be part of the overall system. Uh, and then this last one, I'm, I'm pushing very hard on this, and I would love to work with anyone interested uh, around metadata and API standards. Uh, the reality is, is that you know, almost everyone in between each of those steps that you saw up there is creating an adapter. Uh, my data profiling step is complete, and now I've created some schema that uh, allows my training step to pick up that information and move forward. Uh, we should really, as an industry, join together and standardize on this. And I'm not saying complex standards. Simple schemas um, that allow you to pass information back and forth so you can swap in and out platforms that make sense to you. Oh, you know what? I'm using uh, Hadoop today. I want to use Spark tomorrow. I'm using TensorFlow today. I want to use PyTorch tomorrow. The extent to which we can have standard schemas that describe each one of these known steps, the better off we'll be. 
Uh, or better yet, you tell us. Uh, I'm, uh, again, I, I lead uh, open source machine learning strategy at Azure, so I talk to a lot of folks. I'm working with a number of organizations out there. Uh, I saw that Peter Mattson from Google is talking later today. He's doing some great work in MLPerf around standards. Um, uh, I'm working with the Partnership on AI. Obviously, I, I know the Kubeflow community really well, TensorFlow community really well. Um, we really are looking for anything that you're doing internally that really accelerated your own processes that we might be able to contribute to a community and collaborate around. And I, I love to end my slide with this. It really is a brand new world. Um, and data science will touch every industry. But we can't ask the people who are doing the data science to become experts in things like statistics and things like model training, so on and so forth. Um, and even those data scientists, you know, even if they become experts, that's not enough. We need to go out and empower nurses and realtors and uh, housing authorities and so on and so forth um, with the information that we provide as solutions. And so I really encourage all of you to say like, well, you know what? I'm not just delivering a solution that I know how to use or someone else in my organization has to use. I'm delivering something that someone who has no idea about any of those concepts is able to use and make the world a better place. And with that, you can see my information here. I'm obviously more than happy to answer that. Uh, you can see a demo of using Kubeflow and MLOps together uh, at my uh, repo there. Um, and some general uh, Azure Machine Learning Ops uh, information. Uh, again, all those you know, tools and things that you saw up there for uh, AML are um, just API calls, so you can fold them into any application you want, um, and we're very proud to uh, open source large portions of that, hopefully everything coming soon. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you for that excellent talk. We have time for one question while uh, Francois is, is setting up. So um, I, have, I, have, I have one point of disagreement. <laughs> I apologize for that. And I would like to have you thought on the following. So the point of disagreement is that in your slide, for example, you give the impression that as soon as you are done with the training, it's easy. And I would argue that that's where the most difficult part are. And most of, for example, in my, in my organization, most of the data scientists are very much involved in inference. A yeah. couple of reasons. Uh, because when you deploy models, you need to talk to the online application. Because that's in inference that you yep. do experimentation, this kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, data scientists are very much involved in inference. Yeah, absolutely. OK. I'm sorry. It, forgive me. I, um, I should say that, that, you know, especially in data science and in new industries like this, I you know, obviously kind of jokingly say that there are these two roles. More often than not, people wear multiple hats. So I absolutely agree. Like, um, data scientists aren't just building models. They're tra you know, doing a, a whole bunch of like, data in inputting and ingestion and things like that. And they're working in inference. Like, that's obviously the best practice. But you know, as organizations get larger and larger, people tend to um, isolate themselves. So where I wanted to have your thought was on um, what you talk about metadata, metrics, and feature store. Um, for example, Google had an initiative about um, Feast, a feature store. I haven't seen a lot of um, you know, uh, initiative to build feature store. Yeah. And the challenge, for example, that we do have uh, is that when uh, data is in a data lake, you have specific metrics, metadata, which are not really the ones that you might have when you run, for yep. example, your model on, on Spark. Yep. And um, so basically everybody has online feature store, offline feature store, and uh, yeah, we don't have any help from anyone. I mean, when you look, for example, at workflow management, such as Kubeflow, they don't solve those problems. So any thought on that? Thank you. Yeah, no, no, I, I think that that's really interesting. Um, and again, you know, <laughs> Uh, Azure's as guilty as anyone, but like every major cloud provider does this. It's so funny to me. We, we launch these things, these open data sets, and it's great. You know, you have this NOAA data or the Chicago taxi example or anything like that. And then what do we do? We offer you a tarball. Like, really? That, like, what am I supposed to do with that, right? I have to download it, expand it, I have to like sort it through and things like that. Uh, in Kubeflow, there is a component uh, contributed by Gojek called Feast as a feature store. Again, it's not the end all be all, it, it solves a problem. I think that there's multi layers of problems that we have here. One is how do we uh, share data in a way that is much more useful uh, than, than just sharing tarballs today. Uh, second, how do we uh, give people the option to consume data that just makes sense to them? One of the largest organizations I work with today downloads literally a petabyte of satellite data every day, and the first thing they do is downscale it by 100 times because they don't need the like, raw information, right? That seems silly. Why, why wouldn't they have available the downscaled version? 
Well, because the government doesn't provide it. So they got to figure that out. The extent to which we as an industry could come together on that would be really powerful. Uh, but then third, so now you've, you've made the data useful. You've given people the ability to uh, uh, take just what they need in a sensible way and share it between each other. And then I think you have a feature store on top of that. I think we need to solve all three of those problems. Uh, feature store, look, I would love to have one tomorrow, but I think it's going to be a long haul. I would love to hear your thoughts on what we might be able to start very quickly uh, in order to get going. Thank you, David. Appreciate it.